Okay, hello everybody, and good afternoon. It really is my pleasure to be here on the birthday of IASA as well, to our birth year, I should say, not technically the birthday. The charter was in October, right? And we have two original YSS peers here, two from 1977, and we have the founder of the YSSP. So this is really uh, important, I think, to have, have an event about the YSSP. And not only do we have um, 10, actually nine speakers, Bob Barron was unable to make it today, but um, nine speakers in the session. I count at least eight other people in the program that are former YSS peers as part of the other sessions, myself included. Um, so, um, yeah, so my name is Brian Fath, and I am a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at Towson University, a systems ecologist by training. I was in YCSP in 1997, which at the time um, didn't seem so long ago, but it's exactly halfway of IASA's anniversary, it was 25 years ago, and so that's weird to think I've been with IASA for half of its uh, existence. Um, and since 2011, I have been the scientific coordinator of the YCSP, and it's really been a, a great experience and pleasure to work with so many uh, great uh, PhD students every, every summer coordinating the events that they do. And of course, it can't uh, really exist without the efforts of all the individual mentors and time that YASA scientists put in um, all summer long and all year long, really, to, to make sure the projects are, are successful. So. Um, one other point I was going to say when Jeff Sachs was talking, he was talking about 1972, again, the birth year of, of Yasa, and, and I didn't know he started college that year, so I couldn't have gotten his third point. But Stockholm, the first envir Earth, uh, environmental conference, limits to growth book, and I was sure he was going to say the blue marble photograph was taken in December of 1972. So that, that was the third. 1972 really was a killer year for environmental things, right? So, um, okay. So one of the things that we do at IASA now or with the YSSP is within the first week or at the end of the first week or so, we have them give um, lightning speed talks because it's a way to get all 50 of them up there in one day to, uh, to hear the kind of the catchphrases of what they're working on. And so we thought we would do a session like that today. So anybody who's 2011 or more newer has done this already, right? So you have some experience. Some of the other, other ones that might've been somewhat new, but, but I think you got the idea. So. Um, we have nine speakers and each one has four minutes. I don't have my, my favorite yellow and red lights that I would use if I were to Yasa, where I turn on the lights and the red light means you have to drop your pen and sit down, which sometimes they do, which is fun. Um, but I'll give you a warning when you're basically at four minutes. That's, uh, so I'll keep a stopwatch going. And when you're at four minutes, I'll ask you to go ahead and, um, and let the next speaker go. So we tried to group them by um, kind of uh, classic and, and new, I guess, right? And then also with um, thematically. So we're gonna start with two people from the POP program with Andrew first. Um, so the floor is yours. My slide's coming up? Yes. Yes, I'm not seeing them here, but um, okay. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm, you can uh, advance them. Do I, can I do that myself or do I have to rely on you? Okay, I still can't see them, but um, all right, so um, just, by way of introduction, I wanted to give you some sense of you know where I went. I was part of the YSSP in 85, came back as a Patriot Scholar in 1986. I also may be famous because in 85, I was hospitalized for two weeks due to, due to a, a climbing accident. Um, and I guess that's why they had me come back the next year. Um, since, since leaving YASA, uh, you know, I, I've done work in population. I sort of migrated more into sort of development economics and I've sort of helped the resurgence of development economics as a major field of economics. I uh, put some publications on the field to get you a sense. I, I think in a way that my career has sort of followed some of the changes in, in YASA, you know, did, did some work on agricultural technical change, thinking about using satellite data for environmental issues uh, and so forth. And then, you know, uh, also done some work sort of in systems, thinking about agricultural systems and, and how they work. So, so that's sort of all, all proceeded. Um, uh, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, sort of one project, but sort of lead into that. Uh, really thinking about risk. And so, so a lot of my work has been on risk and I'll focus in particular on a particular problem, for particular households, but I think it does have a broader uh, implications for how, for a sort of problem. And so the basic idea is that untreated risk is a critical aspect of, of, uh, of life in many uh, rural economies and frankly, all of our lives these days. And it's gonna be something that's more important uh, in the presence of, of, uh, of climate change. And you know, one of the things we know is that the sort of trade-off between investment and consumption, both at the household level and more broadly, is importantly affected by the sort of uh, shocks to the, to the system. 
Uh, what I want to bring in here is the idea of dynamic complementarity, and this is something that's received a lot of currency in the context of, of thinking about child development. The idea that the marginal product of inputs, as an economist would say, at different points in one's life are complementary. What you do in third grade affects what you do in eighth grade and so forth. But I think there's sort of a broader, uh, broader point here. And the point is that when you sort of think about dynamic complementarity and risk, that the things paired together have some interesting implications. You know, one implication is that variability over time is going to lead to less of a sort of positive outcome than if it were a smooth input, right? That's the one feature of dynamic complementarity. Another feature of it, which I wanted to focus on here, is the idea of ex ante risk. If you know that the future is going to be risky, you're less likely to be uh, making investments today that are be, being productive because there's some chance that you won't be able to follow through with that. And listening to Michael, I thought like the pandemic is a perfect example of that, right? If you, if you know that a vaccine is coming, you're going to take different actions than if you don't know. Right. And so so the investments you make today are importantly dependent on the sort of risk down the road. And so so that's kind of an idea. And I, you know, I, I don't think that's been thought through so much. And part of what I wanted to do was to think about this problem in the context of human capital investment, uh, because for ch children over their lifetime, that's a long term investment for parents. And these issues of sort of variability over time could play a really um, uh, important role. And so so that's the sort of the emphasis here that if a parent knows that they won't necessarily be able to sort of have their child complete schooling and so forth, then they may not start schooling in the first place. Okay, and so that's the, the basic idea that dynamic complementarity creates in com combination with risk creates this uh, a weaker incentive to make the kinds of investments that may, may, be, may be useful in the long run. Okay. Um, and so this is a hard problem, and so I've you know used sort of uh, uh, data from India collected over 40 years that I've in part been involved with um, that allows one to actually within villages over time see risk changing. Now risk we know will change because of climate, but in general sort of variability to, cl to do climate risk is fairly stable. But what's happened in India as groundwater resources became available, the effect of rainfall risk on uh, on, on overall consumption risk has reduced. And so we can sort of look at households over time and see the variability of their income streams decreasing. And the idea is let's map that into, into changes in investments in schooling. And so we build a sort of dynamic model uh, to sort of see how that works out. Just to give you a sense of some results, you know, uh, the, you know, we're seeing sort of a, a roughly 15%, um, just but on 50% uh, de decline in education associated with risk. Most of that, particularly in the early years, is due to the ex ante effect of people anticipating future risk. Um, then just finishing up, let me just say, I wanna thank uh, YSSB. It really got me started in my career. It had some early publications. And I think more importantly, it built a desire and a practice of interacting with people from different disciplines that has sort of uh, uh, followed through all the rest of my life. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Perfect. Um, LA? Okay. Um, Let me just comment for one second that um, what we're really looking forward to this summer is being in person again. In fact, this room, it's great to be in, in person on a meeting like this and also to see so many people wearing ties. It's so rare, right? Um, but uh, no, it's okay. There's more. I, I try to make a point. In fact, this semester I lectured every day in a tie because I thought I had, you know, basically wore pajama pants for a year. I was ready to actually dress up again. But the point is, Helene was from our last in-person live class 2019. Um, so it's good to see you again and it'll be good to see this year's group. Yes, hi everybody. Um, so the bulk of my research, uh, I thought I would say a few words about what I've been doing at YSSB, which was three years ago, and how it fits into my research. So the bulk of it really focuses on the effects of climate change on human migration. And so we know that climate change affects migration decisions both directly and indirectly, but depending on the context, climate change can either increase migration flows or actually decrease them. Um, so a big part of the migration literature recently uh, has been of kind of more retrospective empirical case studies things, but recently there has been another strand that has really focused on projection exercises of migration in the context of climate change. Often those projections are made with various kinds of economic models, including integrated assessment models or whatnot. Uh, and what's important here is that for a lot of those models, what I needed are scenarios of future development because they're often used as input to economic models. Uh, but when you want to focus on migration specifically, what is needed is not any type of scenario. You're going to want scenarios where uh, the 
evolution of migration, migration patterns is actually made explicit. And so I was looking for those types of scenarios because I wanted to do projection exercises and I couldn't find any. And so I, I thought that I would have to end up developing some on my own. And so, of course, when you start thinking about developing scenarios, you automatically think of YESA. And so I applied to the YSSP program and I got lucky enough to spend the summer of 2019 doing that, developing those scenarios, as well as having a much more intense social life than I've had ever since with the pandemic, really. Um, so I worked with uh, a couple of scientists from the populations program, as well as one scientist from the energy program as well. And we worked on the shared socioeconomic pathways, the SSPs, which is, as probably many of you know, the set of scenarios of future development that is used a lot in climate change research. Um, it is based on five qualitative narratives that you see on the left here. What people don't always know is that those narratives actually have embedded assumptions on international migration in them. They are defined, I don't know if you guys can see, with kind of the rectangles uh, around the five different narratives. What's interesting here is that those assumptions on international migration are very explicit in the population projections of the SSPs, but they are entirely implicit in the other components. So income, inequality, uh, energy consumption, and CO2 emissions. It's entirely implicit in them. And when you think of, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought for a second. And so the, the project that we did here was really to develop versions of the SSPs where international migration effects would be made explicit on all those other components as well. So that project got published last year in Climate Exchange. The way we made the effect of international migration explicit was basically to devise versions of the SSPs with an assumption of for zero migration. I'm going to say right away that those scenarios are not meant to be realistic. What they're meant to do are two things. First, making the effect of international migration on all those components explicit by comparing them to the original projections where migration is hidden. And second, uh, we can actually use those projections as input to modeling exercises of migration where migration is already explicit in the model, so you don't want it in the scenario, in the input scenario as well. So I'm just going to show you results for the income projections because I don't have time to do more than that here. Um, but what we did was to develop versions for zero migration. On the left-hand side, where you see our results, the different color codes are for the five different SSP narratives. And then you're going to see different shapes. Some of you in the back might not see them, but there are one version with circles. That's the original projections that have implicit migration in them. And then the triangles are the ones that we designed with zero migration. And on the right-hand side, you see the panel where you show relative changes between the two. Kind of the takeaway here is that uh, here I'm showing world average per capita income, by the way. And what you're seeing here is that um, migration tends to make the world on average richer all over the century in all of the scenarios of the SSP. So in kind of all of those narratives. Of course, if you look at the country level, uh, you're going to see much more variance in the results. And what's interesting is that the effect of migration doesn't just depend on the country. It also strongly depends on the SSP narrative. And so that made us say that really when you want to do projections exercises, you really want to think about this kind of scenario approach because uh, actually the, the, the results you're going to find are really going to depend, for instance, on pathways of future development. So from a practical standpoint, we really designed those projections to make sure that we stayed consistent with the SSP framework overall. As I mentioned, they can really be used as input in uh, modeling exercises of migration. That's why we designed them. And so in order to make them really more widely available, we actually um, um, included them in the IPCC scenarios database of the last assessment report from Working Group 3. That's actually YASA that's hosting that database. And I'm really excited to get back to YASA finally next month for the Scenarios Forum. Um, and I'm really grateful to, to the YSSP2 for allowing me to, to be part of that community. I didn't put any pictures up because I thought it wouldn't be appropriate. I actually should have, but uh, yeah, maybe Alex has some. I have a classmate here. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next speaker is James McNerney, 2008. Uh, and then uh, to how do I uh, transition? Oh yeah, that's Thank you. Um, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to talk about my YSSP experience uh, as a way to help celebrate this landmark. Um, it was a wonderful experience for me. So I was a YSSP in 2008. Uh, my mentors were uh, Jerry Silverberg and Brian Fath, and my topic was um, I'm trying to read that from over here, <laughs> understanding the properties of inter-industry uh, networks or, or production networks. 
And so um, what this was about was a bit of uh, something of a fishing expedition to understand uh, the properties of this network, um, which are important for a lot of different sub areas of economics. And at that time, it was something that, um, even though this data set had been around for decades, it was not very well characterized in terms of network terms. Um, and so that was, uh, that was what I did that summer was to understand this network. And um, we, we uncovered a lot of interesting things, uh, uh, you know, trying to, you know, understanding what kinds of properties uh, hold across diverse economies that don't have to do with a particular country that you're looking at and sort of raising questions about, well, what are the fundamental mechanisms that govern these, uh, the inter-industry structure of economies? And so this was, the, you know, this is what I focused on that summer. And then um, as, uh, you know, just reflecting back on, uh, on that experience, it was an opportunity. Sorry, I just... Uh, to be able to read the slides. Um, uh, you know, it was an opportunity for me to work on something that was completely new and different. Oh, thank you. Um, this was an opportunity for me to work on something that was completely new and different. Uh, there was an early experience, you know, as a young graduate student working on an idea and developing it from scratch. Uh, it was a chance to work with new mentors. Uh, people, someone uh, who is different from my home institution advisors. It led to a journal publication. It satisfied uh, my curiosity to understand the structure of economies better. And it served as a launching pad for uh, several other research directions to come. And so I just want to uh, briefly tell you about one of those research directions that, that just recently got published. So uh, after I spent this summer trying to understand the structure of economies, there were still a lot of questions on my mind about trying to understand dynamics. So what happens to economies over time as, uh, as technology gets better? And uh, the, what happens as uh, you, you, you uh, improve productivity in different locations and you, uh, you realize spillover effects because these industries are not just uh, improving independently of one another, but they're transacting as part of this network. You know, what happens to, to prices and, and to GDP? So, uh, so those questions uh, led to a, a publication that was published just this past January. And I guess there's something going on with the image, unfortunately, but there's a, there should be a, a paper, <laughs> paper there that says, how production networks amplify economic growth. So this was a paper that was published in PNES back in January. And um, it just goes to show that, you know, sort of my YSSP experience is still paying me dividends years later. So, you know, 13 years after I, I learned what an input output table uh, is and, and sort of had my first foray into learning about economics as a person who's uh, coming from a physics background, um, uh, this experience, short as it was, is still paying me dividends. Um, so this work um, developed two predictions that are latent in economic theory about long-term price evolution and growth. And uh, so one is that industries with longer production chains are biased to realize faster rates of price reduction. And so this, this is the data that, that, that demonstrates this bias. And one of the easiest ways to think about this is just in terms of the contrast between service sectors and manufacturing sectors. Um, manufacturing sectors tend to have longer production chains than service sectors. And because they have longer production chains, they benefit from the accumulation of the productivity improvements of all suppliers that are upstream of them. And so you can derive this mathematically and you can see it very, very clearly in the data. And then you see the opposite with service sectors. Oh, thank you. Uh, where that, that tend to have short chains of production and, and, uh, and lower rates of price reduction. And so this is like a, a, a very basic prediction that was been latent in economic theory for a long time. Mm -hmm that might help explain you know, things like, you know, why do we see different rates of technological progress in different parts of the economy? Um, as it relates to things like Balmo's cost disease. Um, and the other prediction that came out of this was that economies uh, as a whole that have longer production chains are biased to have faster GDP growth. And the mechanism is essentially the same, um, this, this accumulation of productivity improvements. And, um, you know, we, we talk more about this in the paper, but essentially this helps make sense of certain aspects of structural change in economies over the long run. Um, and you can also exploit this to try to build forecasts of GDP. So 
Okay, I'm, I'm going to cut it here. I'm just going to. Uh, but thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to help uh, celebrate this event. Thank Thanks. you. Okay, great. Thanks. And Ingji is our next speaker, uh, who's one of the most recent, just last summer, during the uh, online version that we ran. So nice to meet you finally in person. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm Ingji Lee. Do I have my slides? Yeah, your slides are going. Okay, cool. Uh, how could I go back? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, hi, I'm Ying Jie Li, uh, 2021 uh, vice peer, and uh, from Michigan State. And my son project with Yaza is about uh, to quantify the international spillover impact on achieving uh, national SDGs. So this is a very important but end study topic because uh, most of the existing studies on SDGs have been uh, only look at one single system, but rarely uh, look at the interactions among systems. So, uh, oops. As also Jeffrey Sachs talked about this morning, uh, this afternoon, um, the world become increasingly interconnected, and one country uh, are depend on other countries for food and other kind of resources, um, and there are many um, hidden um, environmental footprint embodied in those uh, in the product um, along the supply chains. Um, so, like uh, for example, uh, there are studies review that the uh, food. The uh, soybean import uh, by EU and China has uh, caused the deforestation risk in Argentina and, and Brazil. Uh, in addition to the environmental footprint uh, embodied in trade, there can be other kind of social footprint in, embodied in trade. For example, there are studies review that uh, in the diamond supply chain, there are a uh, high level of uh, forced labor and, and child labor embodied in, in, in the diamond trade. Um, uh -oh. So uh, to quantify those kind of social and environmental spillover impact embodied in trade, we compiled uh, a list of 62 uh, footprint indicators that can be linked with the SDG indicators proposed by United Nations. Um, for example, in uh, for example, for the uh, let's see the soybean trade example, we can link. Um, the land footprint indicator with uh, one SDG indicator and SDG 15. And similarly, for, uh, for the diamond example, we can link with the uh, uh, occupational uh, safety uh, footprint with another indicator and SDG 8. So with this comprehensive data set, we can basically quantify the impact of international spillovers on all the 17 uh, goals. So as shown in this uh, slides, you can see uh, most of the 17 SDGs benefit from those international spillovers, where only two uh, SDG indicators um, were negatively impacted. Um, and as you can see, both of them are related to uh, inequality related issues. And if further we look at uh, the impact across different income groups, we found the high income country basically uh, benefited more from uh, from from the international spillovers, while uh, low income low income countries uh, uh, benefit less or some uh, even lose SDG scores. Um, to further uh, to look closer uh, to each individual countries, we found like a uh, high income countries uh, generally play a larger role in uh, impact other countries, while well, lower income countries are, are mostly impacted by other countries. To further um, um, review who impact who and by how much we, in, we use a network analysis as still take the, uh, foot, uh, the forest related uh, SDG goal example. From this network, we can find US um, uh, impact a, a list of other countries. Uh, with the most, uh, with the largest impact on, um, uh, I think it's uh, Brazil and, and Canada. So uh, we are currently working on uh, putting this interactive uh, interactive uh, plots online so that we can provide uh, stakeholders a holistic view of the impact on, on SDGs. 
And further building on my um, summer project at YASA, I'm uh, examining the uh, system, interaction, uh, system interaction and the impact on, on SDGs. We are also curious about um, the impact, the potential impact happen uh, in the future may also impact a country's SDG progress. So I'm currently collaborating with um, uh, the Global Elm team, um, which is a, a system model, try to quantify um, whether countries uh, can achieve uh, food and environmental related SDGs by 2030 and, and by how much they will uh, they need to achieve that goals. Um, yeah, um, so this is also part of my uh, um, postdoc research at Stanford uh, starting from this summer. And finally, I would like to thank, uh, thank, uh, thank my collaborators and YASA provides this excellent opportunity uh, and also my uh, um, WSP advisor, uh, Brian, uh, Peter, and collaborators uh, uh, here, uh, Jessica. Thank you all. Thank you, Angie. So could we um, rotate maybe the next group? And we'll need one more chair, though, because all five, there should be five more speakers if you want to come on up, come on up. Yes, you know, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so, go ahead. You guys can sit down. Come on, you can sit up there too. There's enough chairs, right? Go ahead. Hello there. Um, my name is Noah Gottbaum. <laughs> I am a, pride, a proud YSSPer from 1988, um, and it's not a to say that YASA changed my life. Um, I am not a researcher, I'm not a scientist, uh, I'm a businessman, and I want, want to be policymaker. I'm probably the only non-PhD in this room, um, and I don't have any slides. <laughs> But I want to talk very quickly about Yaza's impact on my life and also a hypothesis I have about the Ukraine war. And that is, uh, in 1987, I visited the Soviet, former Soviet Union, and I was struck by it completely. And I said, this is going to change. This is going to blow up. This is going to be completely different. And so I started at Yale in their management school and wanted to get involved. But there were no banks doing this. There were no consulting firms doing this. Um, but someone told me about Yaza. And um, no one had any expertise, really, in this economic transformation, in the move from control economies to capitalism. Um, and Yaza took me in and said, you want to get involved? This is something we're interested in. And uh, I did research on the very first joint ventures, the very first East-West joint ventures, and specifically on the labor and human resource issues involved in joint ventures between communist countries, workers of the world, and capitalist countries. And um, it was absolutely fascinating. Yaza gave me access to everything. Um, I had an office mate named Sergei Glazyev. Uh, I worked with Peter Avin. Um, and I had incredible access everywhere. And now those two are banned by this country, um, which I'm not happy about, as long as uh, Jeff Sachs said. That launched me on a 30-year career advising governments, businesses on economic transformation and investing in emerging markets, developing markets in Eastern Europe. And later, and I think Yaza should take credit for this, impact investing is now the, uh, I don't know, golden calf. It is the biggest thing in the investing world. It has, it's now a $2 trillion enterprise. 10 years ago, it was 20 billion. It's enormous. I think Yaza should take some credit for it because emerging markets, developing markets, climate change, sustainability, that's all impact investing. And you've set that pace. I have a hypothesis 
which I just quickly want to run through. I don't have the slides. I haven't done the research. It's just based on my experience. And that is that the economic transformation route that was chosen by the Russians at, in 1990, when the wall came down, uh, led directly to Putin and this Ukraine invasion. How so? Central Europe, Hungary, Czech, Poland, chose a, a transformation method that was heavily privatization, primarily bringing in Western investors. Uh, they retained, and they also gave equity to in those investments, in their industries, to mass population through uh, investment funds and other ways. They hired Western consultants and they privatized almost all their industries. They didn't hold back. Russia, on the other hand, had what was known as a voucher privatization method, where they handed out seemingly equity to every citizen and every worker in those, in those uh, factories. But what happened was that if I'm a worker uh, in the Komsomol plant, somebody hands me something and someone offers me 10 rubles for it, I'm going to take it. I'm not going to share in this upside. I'm going to take what I got today, which was nothing. And what happened was you had, saw a huge concentration because people in the know were able to uh, take all those vouchers and buy up Russian industry. And that's why you have uh, oligarchs and mass control as opposed to a more democratic system uh, that you have in Poland or Hungary or Czech, even Ukraine. Um, additionally, in Russia, a lot of the industries were held back by government. They were basically handed to some of these oligarchs, but effectively controlled by the government. And so what happened was you didn't get diversification. You didn't get entrepreneurship. You got reliance. And so what, what does that mean for, for the country when you're heavily reliant on natural resources, energy? You're done. You've got economic problems. You want to take your eye off it, and you also want to diversify. And a lot of us think that Putin, what he's doing, is not about power necessarily. It's about economic control. And he wants to control the Black Earth of Ukraine and the industrial segment there so that he can diversify and improve his economy and keep Ukraine as a vassal, economic vassal. Anyway, that's my hypothesis. But Yaza, I love you. I thank you so much. And uh, you don't get enough credit, but uh, I'd love to see this Howard Rafa program go. Thank you. No, I hate to cut you off because it's so fascinating, but we want to stand down. But after, afterwards, we'll talk more in the break. Thank you. OK, the next speaker is Natalia Fath, who was introduced earlier today. <laughs> OK. Hello again. Um, I do have slides, but I realize that I have mostly pictures. So my presentation is only going to be fun, light <laughs> reflection on what we actually got to do back in 1997. And I just need to figure out how to use this. OK, yes. Yeah, so that is 1997, which was a remarkable year for myself because this is when i got to participate in um uh in a land use land cover change project program uh at the time and um uh, it was um so so the 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 idea was to collect um data land use data in russia specifically having in mind uh soil cover soil degradation uh, getting eventually to the use of uh, geographic information systems, which were uh, also mentioned here earlier today. Those were the early years of GIS, right? But we were, yes, getting there, building this up. Uh, 
and uh, specifically, yes, looking for the, the human impact uh, on, on soils and uh, getting to some solutions, possibly. Um, and personal reflection is that, uh, for me, that was a, an absolutely transformative experience because the 90s uh, were not, in, in Russia, were not necessarily favorable to the academia. And after defending my dissertation, I was not working really applying my expertise. So when I learned about this opportunity, I felt like, yeah, that's that's the chance and this is what I want to pursue. And um, yes, that experience actually um, gave me the chance to reconnect with science. And yeah, here are just some of the, again, a lot of illustrations, like I said, uh, project members, land use, land cover change, uh, friends. Some of the friends became more than just friends. We've been sharing the same last name since that time, basically. <laughs> so I, I feel like we, uh, we actually, yes, lived up to one of the goals that were set by, yes, sir, we did build our bridge. Um, and <laughs> um, so what I was doing the, the, the decade, two decades after that, um, applying the, the appreciation of the systems approach uh, to my teaching career, and I specifically am enjoying and am really fond of, of the, the class that uh, I created that is called environmental geography. And this is where I am um, repeatedly emphasizing the importance of the systems approach to my students uh, and in emphasizing specifically that point that on an integrated approach, systems approach can help us uh, with you know, when, when you try to come up with a solution and then uh, there are always unintended consequences. So keeping this in mind, right? So this is what I am um, working on, on promoting. Uh, just a couple comments on some of the projects, for example, that we're doing with the students. Uh, uh, city dwellers, the Baltimore city, we've uh, been working on inventorying uh, the attitudes, for example, toward um, fruit trees being planted in the city. And map on the right shows you actually the, the food deserts in the Baltimore city. So we gonna, we had those two goals in mind, alleviating food insecurity, mitigating climate change. Another project that we worked on was specifically devoted to the, um, the carbon offset calculation. And based on the um, based on the urban fruit trees that were um, that were planted in Baltimore, and thinking about the future, uh, crowdsourcing sounds like uh, is something where we want to go. This is also one of the mainstream Yasa strategies these days. And I know I'm wrapping up. Thank you so much for your attention uh, and for this opportunity to share my experience, my life changing experience with Yasa. Thank you. Seven group photos all the time, and I didn't know about it. Those are missing from the uh, from the ASA archives. So I know I don't have them. She had. It. Okay, so Redos, another land use change model, little solution. Go ahead. Hi everyone, um, and thank you for having me. I was YSSP 2017, uh, and I'm currently a postdoc at Boston University. So YASA for me was a life-changing experience as well. It was some of the best times of my life, uh, and it was also a place where I made a lot of meaningful professional connections. My research interests are in land cover and land use, and today I'd like to focus specifically on my work in uh, quantifying land degradation. So uh, first, a little bit about my YASA experience, what my YSSP experience. I was in the Ecosystem uh, Services and Management Program. And as a result of my YSSP days, I had a publication with my YASA co-advisors. I also uh, had a collaboration with a YSSP fellow on um, uh, foreign land acquisitions and remote sensing. I contributed a chapter to a book that Brian Fath was editing. 
And as you can see, the topic of both of these things was pasture lands and a more broadly agricultural land use. However, what YASA contributed most to my career was actually that it sparked a lot of ideas for new research, and in particular, my interest in studying the sustainable development goals. Since YASA, I've expanded my research interest to include not only agriculture, but more broadly all land uses. And in particular, I'm interested in the sustainable development goals, as I said, and degradation. So the UN has declared this, uh, this decade from 2021 to, 20, to 2030 uh, as the decade on ecosystem restoration. However, we don't really know where degradation is happening to begin with. Since my expertise is in remote sensing, which is using observations, Earth observations from space, I'm focusing in particular on uh, SDG 15, which is about land. Um, so degradation is defined as the decrease in economic or biological productivity of the land, and SDG 15 in particular aims to restore degraded lands and to halt degradation. And degradation is important because it impacts about 25% of the Earth's land, uh, surface, and it impacts the livelihoods of up to 3 billion people worldwide. As you can see in the graphic on the left-hand side, degradation is important because it impacts our health through food security and threatening food security, and also it impacts the economy through uh, perpetuating poverty, the poverty cycle, basically. So now I want to share with you some results that I have on land degradation. Uh, in particular, I focused on South, South America, the Southern Cone, that's Uruguay, Paraguay, and Argentina. And these are important places in the world because they've uh, undergone a huge transformation over the last few decades due to agricultural expansion and in particular production of soybeans. This image here shows degradation. The places in green are places that we don't have to worry about so much. And then places in brown are places that are either degrading or degraded. And this is important in terms of policy because places in light brown that are currently degrading, those are places that could be uh, where degradation could be halted and reversed. And those are places that could be the focus of this, eco uh, of this decade on ecosystem, ecosystem restoration. I want to zoom in in some places in South America. So this is de showing degradation in the dry Chaco. This is the dry forest of South America. And degradation here is largely driven by expansion of agriculture into forests. Uh, again, this is soybeans. We also have degradation that's caused uh, by exp agricultural expansion into natural grasslands in the Uruguayan savanna. We have degradation happening uh, also in uh, you know, for a little further down in Argentina, again, this is agricultural expansion into dry forests and natural ecosystems. And lastly, I want to focus on the pa uh, Patagonian steppes, where we have places that aren't yet degraded, they're in the process of degrading. And again, those are places where an intervention uh, by the UN can actually make a difference, and degradation here could be halted and reversed. And with that, I'd like to conclude my slides, and thank you for your time. Uh, I can take any questions, I guess, later, but this was a little illustration of our time at YSSP uh, in the summer of 2017. Thank you. Thank you, Edward. Perfect. Okay, um, and Mark, you would be up next then, going back to the early days again. <laughs> well, I've been delighted to uh, connect with another fellow YS. As peer from 1977, so that was a terrific to uh, see that. So just a few remarks. Um, first on what did I, uh, my, my topic is IASA making a difference. So when I got to IASA in 1977 and again in 1979, I gotta say it, it was a remarkable, joyous experience. And I'll just comment on four quick aspects. One was that ability to span the East and West. We had the most secretive, I think, at the time of the across the Iron Curtain countries, the DDR, and trying to figure out how are we going to work with them, noting they could come over with they could come over by themselves, the, the scientists, but not the families, as if my memory serves me, because that was a guarantee they would not leave the DDR. And uh, so it was quite remarkable, and we did make that span, and that was that was wonderful. Um, a second point is um, we took a very intensive look at the use of coal and nuclear power systems at the time in the four regions we were working in, Austria, Rhone-Alp region of France, DDR, the Leipzig region, and, and the Wisconsin, state of Wisconsin. 
And that was quite remarkable. We were looking at a much longer time frame then. We were worried about half-lives of 5,000, 10,000 years. Now I worry about, you know, what do you think about half-life with climate change coming at us? And uh, it's, it's a much, things have shrunk. But what's interesting in, the, in all of those countries is that that impact at the time and some of the significant shifts, and I would say at this point, significant shifts, perhaps in all of the regions away from the nuclear and away from the coal, with the exception of France, which was, I think many of you know, the tremendous, interesting situation there. Third point, the decoupling of economic growth and energy and energy growth. That's, we take that for granted now, but boy, back at that time, after limits of growth, we were thinking about these things to be able to model these economies, industrial, commercial, industrial, residential uses, and to, to be able to see how those could be separated, decoupled, was really remarkable, both by economic, uh, including economic incentives, but also frankly in the ddr non-economic incentives how would you decouple but you're not going to have price elasticities doing the job for you at that time and finally the application of decision theory and decision makers we used howard uh, howard rafa ralph keeney rafa uh, a multi-attribute decision analysis we applied that and i can recall doing assessments of of public service commission commissioners in Wisconsin, who are trying to figure out what to do about this decoupling question, how many new, more nuclear power plants we're gonna have, doing formal assessments of their risk-taking or risk-averse uh, uh, um, attitudes and trying to apply this in, in about 10, 12 different multi-attribute factors. So it was fascinating work. How does this, has this impacted me in my career? Well, there's four phases in my career. I'm old enough to have four phases. The first one was uh, in academics, UW-Madison, UW wonderful time. A lot of modeling helped found the energy analysis policy program along with Wes Fells and Wes Fell and a number of other wonderful fellow colleagues. And then after that, after the fall of the Iron Curtain, international work, much of it in the former Soviet Union, looking at how do we bring in efficiency and some of these other things we've been working on, that same decoupling question. And, uh, and, and working on that and trying to do economic reform. How do you bring in price incentives? And we've heard some good explanation a few minutes ago of why some of that did not go so well. Thirdly, my third phrase, phase was when I went to the Energy Center of Wisconsin as the director there. And wonderful time of, again, research systems analysis. But it, you know, it was that ongoing struggle, 60 employees at, at the point I left, uh, you know, struggling for budgets every year, trying to convince people to fund this or try a demonstration of that, and all kinds of people are afraid of all kinds of stuff. And at that point, I go to phase four, which is uh, what I still do at least part-time in my semi-retirement, which is just sustainable commercial buildings. And it goes from a point of struggling with 6 million a year to a situation where we've now got a firm, we're doing about 50 million a year in projects. And in these projects, we're bringing in all this stuff, the efficient lighting, the renewable energy, this and that, that, that people were afraid to try at the research institute and not us, but our funders were afraid to try. And here now you can just sort of see it as a big laboratory. And so that's been the, the, the last phase is doing this, this, this work um, out there. Our current things that we're working on now, what keeps me working in a happy state, uh, at least part-time, is our solar projects, our battery projects, our net zero energy projects. And I have not lost all my academic ways. I did publish a book a couple of years ago, The, in the Inevitable Solar School which is at one of our school sites uh, with solar. And uh, with that, thank you. Thank you. I love the tie. <laughs> OK, thanks, Mark. All right, and then the last. Hello? It sounds like it's working. All right. Okay. Oh, here it is. Okay. 
All right. We're on camera too. Oh, yeah, I'll stand here. Okay. okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Alex Nukovich. I um, did YSSP back in 2019. Narsima um, was one of my advisors who was so wonderful that summer. Um, unfortunately, Ellen might have prematurely said that I have photos. I don't, but happy to reminisce about them during the reception later on today. So as many of you in this room should probably know, the world is rapidly urbanizing. Um, today, um, new emerging technologies that sense um, different components of our cities and other smart city initiatives are creating a windfall of structured and unstructured data streams describing the urban built environment. Some of those data streams are things like building characteristics, historical weather data, and high frequency energy use data from things like smart meters. Um, however, cities across the world are quite different from one another. They have different levels of data availability. And so the large component of my PhD looked at how to leverage data science and other machine learning techniques in conjunction with physical modeling techniques to understand how to utilize data to understand building energy performance in what I call data rich and data sparse cities. So my specific research that I did with Narsima and a couple other colleagues at IASA um, a few years ago was looking at the data sparse component of my PhD. And specifically, I was focusing on informal settlements, also typically known as slums. So today, about 2 billion people globally, um, or actually by 2030, 2 billion people globally are expected to be living in informal settlements. And they're typically characterized by a poor quality of infrastructure, specifically in the built environment. Um, there we go. And so, uh, some emerging practices that NGOs and other local governments across the world are trying to do now is what's called slum redevelopment, essentially taking existing low rise informal settlements, demolishing them and rebuilding them um, at a higher density with theoretically better design and construction practices than before. Um, specifically, I'm interested in the design of those buildings with regard to my PhD in my research at IASA. So, it's well known that the building design and morphology of these buildings are critical to their energy performance later on. And we know that building design can also have a drastic impact on human thermal or human well being and thermal comfort. And we also know that, that the design decisions being made today by these local governments and NGOs will have massive impacts on the energy future of these communities for decades to come. And so the objective of my research that summer at IASA was to develop a computational framework that evaluated early stage design decisions for these informal settlement redevelopment projects to look at heat stress within these buildings and related cooling energy demand for the future. So I don't have all the time in the world to talk about the cool methodology and all of the results, but I'll give you a, oh, I have one minute, cool. Um, <laughs> so, Quick results overview. So basically we ran about 150,000 unique models looking at a range of different design options in these informal settlements for 17 cities across the world and found that as you probably would expect the building envelope, so things like the roof, the floor, the wall constructions had the greatest impact on heat stress exposure and cooling energy demand in future redeveloped buildings. We utilized that information to explore different retrofit and redevelopment um, opportunities to reduce both current and future cooling energy demand and heat stress exposure and found that a low cost cool roof paint could be deployed across many different cities in the world to reduce current and future heat stress exposure. Um, I'll give a quick plug to what I'm doing today. So I left academia last summer when I finished my PhD, and I now work in the city's practice at a company called Borough Happold. We essentially do a lot of transdisciplinary of integration of energy, mobility, water, waste, um, engineering to create more sustainable cities. Um, so I'm, I wanna highlight a very related project to what I did part of my IASA work on, which was looking at heat stress and equity in 88 cities across Los Angeles. We worked with the County of LA, um, looking at different climate hazards and where across the County of LA, there was more or less um, vulnerability to changes in future climate moving forward. Um, happy to chat about it more later today, but I'm really excited to be here and thank you all for listening. Thank you.